This video is supported by Squarespace. Peter and Myra Welton were a retired couple living in Hull, England in 2009, just enjoying a nice weekend afternoon with their grandkids, uh, when suddenly a loud bang shook the house. Peter went up into the attic to see what happened, and he found that something had smashed a hole in their ceiling, and right below that was a smoldering hunk of metal. It was so hot they had to carry it downstairs with oven mitts. They shared this with the police, who had no idea what it was. The police shared it with the British military, who were just as confused. This weird hunk of metal finally made its way to NASA, who were able to confirm that, yeah, it was a piece of space debris from a satellite that burned up in the atmosphere, and it just happened to land on their home. Unlucky for them, obviously, but luckily nobody was hurt, and they got a good story out of it. And they got to keep it. The Wilton story is not altogether unique, though. Between 200 and 400 pieces of space debris fall through our atmosphere every year. Now, of course, most of it burns up in the atmosphere, and most of the world is uninhabited, so the chance of getting hit by one is very, very slim. Ironically, though, the fact that all that stuff is falling down from space is actually a good thing. That's exactly what you want it to do. The real problem is that so much of the stuff we've put up there has never come down. A problem that might not just keep us from progressing as a species, but if we don't do something about it soon, could set us back decades. Last week marked the 61st anniversary of the launch of Sputnik, the first satellite in space. Now, Sputnik didn't do much more than just beep, but the hundreds of satellites that followed it have completely changed our way of life. From instant cell phone communication to internet service to broadcast TV, GPS, the list goes on and on. But along with these wonderful transformative satellites, we've also put a lot of other stuff up there. Empty rocket stages, various equipment, nuts and bolts. Literally, nuts and bolts. Nuts and bolts flying around at 17,000 miles an hour, over 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. Just a quick primer to enter orbit around the Earth, you actually have to travel perpendicularly to the direction of gravity by 17,000 miles an hour in order to enter a state of basically perpetual falling. That's why astronauts are weightless in outer space. It's not because gravity isn't working on them anymore, it's because they're basically constantly falling and never hitting the ground. You know, we see these videos of spaceships docking in orbit, and it looks like they're just slowly floating towards each other until they lock into a lover's embrace above the clouds like a slow motion ballet, which was perfectly depicted by Stanley Kubrick in 2001, set to Blue Danube. <laughs> When in actuality, Slayer would have been a better choice of music. Because in order to dock with something in space, first of all, you have to get into space, which is an achievement all its own, but then you have to travel up to 22 times the speed of sound to get caught up to the same speed as that thing that you're docking with before you can start doing the whole dance. Not to mention timing your launch and trajectory just right to reach the right orbit and the right destination. There's a reason why they call this rocket science. So the problem isn't just that there's a lot of stuff floating around in space, the problem is the speed at which that stuff is traveling. Because the kinetic energy of an object is the square of its velocity, so if an object is traveling 10 times that of a speeding bullet, it actually has 20 times the kinetic energy of a speeding bullet. And just in case you need a reminder, getting hit by one speeding bullet is bad. I'm taking a minute to talk about this because these are speeds and energies that we can't even fathom. We literally can't experience that here on the ground. We literally can't. Anything traveling at that speed at sea level would instantly vaporize. And right now these objects are buzzing around the satellites that make our way of life possible. How many, you may be asking? <laughs> you might want to sit down for this. Right now there are more than 750,000 pieces of debris floating around out there that are currently being tracked by various agencies around the world, including the Air Force. The vast majority of these objects are between 1 and 10 centimeters in size, with 16,000 pieces larger than 10 centimeters. Many of these are spent rocket stages and dead satellites. In fact, only 1 in 10 satellites in space are currently functional satellites. But just in case you haven't fully evacuated your bowels yet, let's talk about the pieces of debris that are smaller than 1 centimeter, also known as micro debris. Remember the episode that I did on plastics where I was talking about how the big garbage patches in the ocean get broken down into microplastics that find their way into our food stream and how that's the real problem? Well, this is like that, except those microplastics are traveling fast enough to tear you in half. And there is an estimated 150 million pieces of micro debris floating around in space. Too small to be tracked, but carrying enough energy to do this. This happened on the space shuttle mission STS-7 in 1983, and it was caused by a fleck of paint smaller than one millimeter. Flecks of paint are especially rampant in space because these satellites and spent stages go out there, and they've got paint on them, and the sun bombards this paint for years and years, it deteriorates, it flecks away, and ruins everyone's day. Right now there's a similar crack on the cupola window of the International Space Station. And images of Hubble's solar panels show dozens of pockmarks caused by micro debris. 
Right now, space is basically a cosmic shooting gallery. Already, this problem has been a headache for space agencies. At least once a month, the ISS has to perform maneuvers to avoid a piece of space junk, and every launch has to take space debris into account when making their flight plan, as if there's not enough factors to consider already. But these are just headaches. The real problem was illustrated by former NASA scientist Donald Kessler in 1978. He proposed a situation where we get so much space debris up there that inevitably collisions would occur, which would create more debris, which would create more collisions, which would cause more debris, and then more collisions, until you reach a point where there's so much debris up there, it's impossible to launch anything into space without it being ripped to shreds. Earth would basically be encased in a shell of billions of pieces of flying metal making it impossible to ever leave Earth. No colonizing the Mars or Moon, no traveling the solar system. We would be stuck here permanently on this planet. Forever. Oh, and all those wonderful satellites that make our entire way of life possible? Gone. Humanity would be set back at least 50 years. This became known as the Kessler Syndrome. An event like this was depicted in the movie Gravity, but the part that they left out was Sandra Bullock returning to a planet that doesn't have any internet or cell phone service. And this process of debris creating collisions, creating more debris, has already gotten started. In 2009, the Iridium-33 satellite, a U.S. communications satellite, smashed into a defunct Russian Cosmos 2251 satellite at a speed of 26,000 miles an hour, creating more than 2,000 pieces of space junk across a debris field thousands of kilometers long. And on multiple occasions, the crew of the ISS has had to retreat down into the Soyuz capsules as they pass by this debris field, you know, just in case. But as humans, we aren't content to just let randomness and chance bork things up for us. No, that's way too slow. So we've taken things into our own hands. In 2007, China conducted a test of an anti-satellite missile system, destroying their FY-1C weather satellite with a kinetic impactor, creating an estimated 150,000 debris particles. Cause yeah, screw that satellite! Actually, it was a test of their ASAT missile. ASAT stands for anti-satellite. That's just a class of missile that countries use to shoot down an enemy country's satellite. And before you start thinking too badly about China, just keep in mind that the United States did the exact same thing in 1985. Back at the height of the Cold War and strategic defense initiatives, the U.S. tested their ASM-135 ASAT missile by blowing up the Solwind P-78-1 satellite, creating several hundred pieces of debris from that. But perhaps the dumbest thing ever done in regard to space debris was something that the U.S. military did called Project Westford in 1963. Okay, so today if you want to send a signal to the other side of the world, you bounce it up off of a satellite and it gets ricocheted back down to where you want to contact somebody. Of course, this did not exist back in 1963, so the U.S. military, wanting to have that ability to do that, decided to get a little bit creative. They figured out that if we created a halo around the planet made out of tiny copper wire, we can maybe bounce a signal off of that, kind of like an artificial ionosphere. So they launched and dispersed into orbit around the Earth 480 million tiny copper needles. The good news is the project worked. The bad news is the project worked. Most of the needles by now have fallen back to Earth, but some of it is still up there to this day, now clumped together into bigger pieces of space debris. Now, I've talked enthusiastically on this channel about how private companies like SpaceX and Rocket Lab are democratizing space and making satellite technology available to more people than ever before. I've extolled the ingenuity of India's space program and their ability to put 144 satellites up in only one launch. It's a new space race, I've said so many times, it makes you want to puke. And this is awesome and amazing, but let's just get real for a second. Are we just making this problem worse? Now there is a group called the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee that has proposed some guidelines to help keep this problem in check. And they include a maximum orbital lifetime of 25 years, a mandate that satellites have the ability to deorbit at the end of their use, or the satellites be elevated into designated graveyard orbits to minimize interaction with active satellites. The members of this committee include NASA, Roscosmos, the ESA, the CSA, ISRO, JAXA, and many other state agencies around the world. But at the time of this recording, no private space launch companies. And there are some plans in the works to get rid of some of the worst offenders in orbit right now. NASA has a plan called Space Debris Illumination, or also known as SPADE, which involves blasting bursts of air into areas of debris, which would slow down their velocity enough to send them back down towards Earth. The ESA has a program called DE Orbit that involves capturing space junk with a giant net. There's a concept called the Electrodynamic Debris Eliminator that uses the Earth's magnetic field to drift toward defunct satellites and then guides them back toward the atmosphere with a giant net. An idea from Texas A&M University called the TAMU Slingsat actually uses the velocity of the space junk to propel it to the next piece of space junk, releasing it back towards the Earth as it goes. And then there's a proposed laser orbital debris removal system that uses high-powered lasers from tracking stations on the ground that can zap space junk and either slow its inertia enough to fall or push it higher into a graveyard orbit. Now all of these are interesting ideas, but at the moment that's 
all they are is ideas. They've all been stalled due to lack of funding. But there is one glimmer of hope, a project from the UK called Remove Debris, which just last month was able to capture a runaway CubeSat with a net. Ultimately, the idea is to capture the debris in a net and then tow it back toward the Earth, but so far they've only tested the net, not the towing mechanism, but it worked, so I guess that's a start. Now, at the risk of sounding like a Debbie Downer, this is a very tiny first step toward fixing a gigantic and overwhelming problem that should have been started 10 years ago, but yay? Now, many scientists think that we've already reached a tipping point on this, that there's already so much stuff up there that it's inevitable that eventually we're going to start to see this chain reaction take place unless some urgent action is taken. You know, I'll be honest, in these videos, I always try to find some kind of surprising other side of the issue. I try to find the contrarian argument that maybe people aren't expecting. So I tried really hard to find just one article from one scientist that said that this was overblown, that it's a problem that's going to fix itself, that it's not as bad as it's been made out to be. And I couldn't find it. Literally not one. We are entering a new era of space travel, one where private companies take center stage and it opens up new opportunities that we've never had before, and this is incredibly exciting. But it's incumbent on private and public industries to take this problem seriously and do some urgent action, because without some kind of fast action on this, it's all gonna go away. And it's gonna take all of our hopes and dreams about the future with it. So get the word out about this. Make this problem known. Find a space cleanup project and passionately back it. One great way to do that is with Squarespace. Squarespace is a premium online website platform that makes it easy to create professional websites without having a PhD in computer science or years of experience as a graphic designer. They've got easy to use drag and drop templates that make you look way more talented than you really are with widgets that superpower your site and e-commerce solutions to great customer service for the noobs. Make a website on Squarespace to tell the world about the space junk problem. You can call it dirtyspace.com or myjunkinspace.com or or, or filthyspace.com. Oh, that sounds bad. But that might grab an audience. I'm gonna be mad if nobody does that. Head to squarespace.com slash Joe Scott for a free one month trial. And if you decide to sign up for their services, enter Joe Scott at checkout and you'll get 10% off the purchase of a website or domain. Whatever it is you're passionate about, the best way to get started is to create a website. Squarespace makes it easy. So go to squarespace.com slash Joe Scott, links down in the description. I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video and a big huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon that help it keep the lights on around here and are building a huge wonderful community and I can't thank you guys enough. There's some new people joining that I want to give a quick shout out to. Let me murder their names real quick. We've got Maxim Rukinov, awesome name ever, uh, Kurt Coaches, Tim Leaf, David Fongione, David S. Martinez, Jonathan Harmontes, uh, Joel Adams, Brody McLeod, uh, Frank Zemes, here we go, Alexis de Wurters de Oplinter, sure. Wayne Webster, Tom Bamford, J Jan Keppers, Frank Zemes, Anna Pirato, <laughs> Alexander Lackinson, uh, Ian Monleith, Helen Tarski, I'm doing great here, guys. Mr. Pub247, uh, Chase Capiotti, Taryn and Woody Mantooth, CRT Hayes, Felipe Kafuri, and Daniel Daryl Perko. Killed it! Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to some stuff that other people don't get to have, and again, just join a really awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available in the store at answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, check out some of the other videos. You might like those too. And if you do, hit subscribe. I'll come back with videos just like this every Monday. Videos just like this, not always uh, quite so terrifying. So usually. All right, thanks a lot for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.